Well, hello and welcome to another Wednesdays in the Word. I am Pastor Autry, and today we will continue our study in 1 John, beginning at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And in today's video, we want to raise the issue, what are the five false teachings that Christians tend to embrace? Thank you for joining us again. I think today is one of the most pertinent teachings that we will get as Christians because we're in a day where we are bombarded with a plethora and a bevy of ideas, diverse ideas. And not all of them are bad, but some do masquerade as Christian teachings when they are not. And so what I want to do today, I want to share with you a number of scriptures that underscores the importance of this principle of knowing bad teaching and being able to identify it. And then I want to share a few observations. And finally, then we will talk about those five false teachings that Christians tend to embrace. And so listen to just the number of scriptures that address this issue. Case in point, the scripture that we're studying today, look what it says, 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, or that is, an individual that comes with teaching, but test the spirits, that is, test the, the teaching, to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus Christ is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. We dealt with that, and of which... Uh, you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Just from this scripture, I want you to notice that the false teaching is not something that bombards the church from without, but it's actually Christians who started in the faith on the inside and actually ventured out. I want you to notice that and you're going to see it in numerous scriptures. They started scriptures. They started within the church. They started as probably solid believers, but somehow they got a hold of some bad teaching and they begin to venture out, out of the circle of faith, out of traditional, or I shouldn't say traditional, orthodox doctrine and began to embrace teachings that are actually antithetical to what the Christian faith stands for. So, and that is one. Here's another one. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. Here's what it says. Be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, this is Paul talking, savage wolves, Jesus used that word, will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among them, you, I'm sorry, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So there, you see, even in the early church, there were challenges. Jesus even addressed this issue. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 23, look what he says. Beware of false prophets who come to you, what? In sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there, even in the time of Jesus, there were false teachings, there were false prophets. And I want you to notice one consistent theme. These were individuals who actually believed the Christian faith but they ventured out, they moved beyond and thought they had something better than what Christ was teaching. And so I wanna share with you just a few observations to be aware of from 1 John chapter four, uh, verses one through six, that can help us discern false teaching. Number one, and I think this may be most important, beware of the temptation to add or subtract from what has already been taught. Beware of that temptation, my brothers and sisters. 
For whatever reason, there is a temptation in the Christian faith to add what I think ought to be there or to take away what God has already stated. Look at, look at what verse one says in chapter four. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Why did they go out into the world? They added or they took away. Case in point, in the letter that John writes, it's Gnostics. They have taken away from the deity of Christ. He is not the son of God. He simply possesses a Gnostic spirit that can descend on you as well. And so beware of that temptation. Many false teachers will add to the gospel, add to the word, something that has never been taught, or they will subtract from it, diminishing the power of the gospel. Number two, always remember that Jesus is the foundation or the arbiter to determine what is true and what is false. That's what John does right here. He's the anchor. Look what he says, verse two through three. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. There it is. So usually, almost nine times out of ten, people will slowly but subtly begin to push Jesus out the picture and replace Jesus with themselves or some alternative teaching, or some teacher that they want you to embrace. And so that's one way to know whether it's true or whether it is false. And number three, the gospel will always have a third supporting anchor, and that is apostolic authority. And that what comprises of our New Testament letters, the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul's epistles, Peter's epistles, other epistles, these were the original followers of Christ. And so they validate or they affirm what the Lord is teaching. So it, it starts with Christ and then it starts with the apostles. That's what he means right here in verses five through six. Look what he says, they are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world and the world listens to them. We, who is we? The apostles, John, he's an apostle. He walked with Jesus. He, he saw his ministry. He was given authority to carry the teachings of Christ to the church. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know, here it is, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So my brothers and sisters, it starts with Christ and it starts also or falls with apostolic authority, which are the epistles in the New Testament. And so what are the five false teachings that Christians tend to embrace? Number one, you can lose your salvation. This is a big one. I haven't seen it a lot, but it's slowly beginning to creep back into the body of Christ that somehow my salvation is not dependent on what Christ has done 2,000 years ago, but it's based on what I do. No, my brothers, the power of the gospel is not based on what I do. No, my salvation is based on what Christ has done or what he did 2,000 years ago, which is my eternal security. The second thing I want to raise here is that many times when we talk about eternal security or assurance of salvation, many people think what we are implying is that somehow that because of my security, I have a license to do whatever I want and nothing can be further from the truth. No, if we've been born again, if God's spirit has been placed in us, we ought to have a new behavior or a new desire for the things of God. What we're saying is, is that if we've been born again and God's spirit has been placed in our heart, we are are his children. And yes, in one sense, I could possibly, God forbid, divorce my wife or my wife divorce me and not be with her and be separated from her. But I could never be divorced from my earthly father. Why? Because there's a biological connection that connects me to him forever. Likewise, if that's true in the earthly realm, how much more is it true in the spiritual realm? We've been adopted into God's spiritual family. We have God's DNA living on the inside. We have a spiritual connection to our heavenly father. That's why he told us to pray our father. I've already done a study on this. There is a link to that study in the description box in which you can examine at your leisure. Number two, Christians must speak in tongues in order to be saved. And sadly, this is a perversion of the gospel because now you're placing conditions 
or requirements on salvation when Paul clearly said in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift. Salvation is a gift and therefore we cannot add anything. But there has been this movement in the past and it's slowly beginning to rear its head that somehow you have to speak in tongues or you have to add a particular work or behavior in order to be saved or to be called a Christian. Nothing can be further from the truth. You can put here 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul clearly implies that, listen, all do not speak in tongues, even though all have been baptized. And there are plenty of other examples that would indicate that many Christians were saved, but they didn't speak in tongues, even though they had the Spirit of God working through their lives and residing in their hearts. So no, Christians do not have to speak in tongues to be saved. Surely there are Christians who do speak in tongues, but it is not a requirement or a prerequisite for salvation. Number three, and I think this is a very important one because I've been seeing this one rear its head in more recent days, and that is Christians are obligated to keep the Mosaic law or the Old Testament law. And, and the idea is something like this, you know, okay, you, you do need Jesus, but you got to keep the Sabbath. You do need Jesus, but you must be circumcised. You do need Jesus, but you got to practice the dietary laws. And the way it's sold to Christians is that you must hate God's laws. Why are you not honoring God's laws? And nothing can be further from the truth. No, in Christ, the Bible teaches that Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He fulfilled what we never could do on our own. And there are plenty of scriptures on this. You can put here Romans chapter 6, verse 16, uh, 14, where he says, For sin shall not be master over you. You are no longer under law, but you are under grace. You can put here Galatians 5. That whole chapter is good for you. As well, James chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, For whoever keeps the whole law, and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. And so beware of this one. Listen, people want to add to Christianity and say, somehow I have to keep the law in order to be saved. No, you don't have to keep the law. Christ has fulfilled the law for us. And now we live to him by loving one another. And as one writer said, or Paul says, and in this word, the whole law is fulfilled by loving one another. Number four, and this is an important one and really comes with prosperity teaching. And that is Christians have the power to decree or speak whatever they want into existence. And it's based on a faulty understanding of a passage of scripture in Romans chapter four, verse 17. I'll read, I'll read it for you. Here's what it says. <clears throat> for it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, here it is, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. And so here, this scripture, Christians have taken it to mean that, listen, I can call into existence that what does not exist. And they assume that the passage is talking about Abraham when, in fact, if you look closely, the qualifier is God. God is the one who speaks things into existence. God is the one that spoke the world into existence. That's the point that Paul is making. It is not Christians that speak things into existence. No, God has the power. And many times if we're not careful, we can be mimicking here New Age theology or some kind of Eastern mysticism where the individual thinks they're God when in fact Almighty God, the creator of all things, is the one that we are to honor. And number five, our last one, and yet I think it's an important one. And you're going to see this uh, even more as we go deeper into the 21st century. And here it is. Jesus is simply a great exemplar or a model for faith. He really isn't the son of God. He is not the son, second person of the Trinity. He is not God in the flesh. You're going to see this more often. It's already beginning with the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is being chipped away as not a part of the Godhead. It really begins with in, uh, those Christians have an issue with this idea of a triunal God. They're struggling with it. And I'll be the first to say it's a very complex doctrine, but to say that it doesn't exist in scripture is really 
uh, uh, suggest that one is not reading the scriptures close enough. And so my brothers and sisters, those are the five teachings that I think are really, really uh, prevalent in our culture that many times uh, Christians are susceptible to buy in and think that somehow these are of Christ or of scriptures. Uh, and, and, and I just want you to be aware of them. We have the power of the gospel on our side. We need not shrink from the truth. I want to throw a question for discussion in the chat, and I sure would love to hear from you. Are there other teachings that Christians need to be aware of that are false teachings that maybe you have heard that we surely have to be aware of? Would you type that in the chat? I sure would like to hear from you. I'll do my best to respond to you as we want to continue to grow in our faith. God bless you, and I'll be looking for you in the next segment. Take care.